Premier Ford announced today that the Ontario stay-at-home order will remain in place until at least June 2nd. Previously, the Ford government imposed restrictions on outdoor amenities under the Reopening Ontario Act. Since then, there have been multiple calls from politicians and the public to ease these restrictions, including by Brampton Mayor and the province's own science advisory table. In fact, this Monday, the Toronto Board of Health voted unanimously on the motion to urge the Ford government to lift the ban. However, the provinces insist that these outdoor amenities will remain closed until cases significantly decline so as to discourage mobility. Many opponents on this ban argue that the restrictions do little to curb COVID-19 and will have disproportionately negative impacts on children who are unable to access green spaces. I'm joined with NDP MPP Sarah Singh to reflect on these issues. Welcome MPP Sarah Singh. How do you see Premier Doug Ford's announcement today to maintain Ontario's stay-at-home order in place until at least June 2nd? You know, I think um, it's uh, another disappointing announcement for many people here in the province of Ontario. Um, you know, I think what is really frustrating for a lot of folks is that we see lockdown after lockdown, but yet, you know, the government and, and Premier Ford really failed to follow public health recommendations. Um, still in the province of Ontario, workers have access to a very limited uh, paid sick day program. Um, it would have been great um, to see that program amplified today. Um, also, you know, lots of frustration around the vaccine rollout and making sure that our communities are getting uh, their fair share of vaccines here in Peel and across Brampton. Um, you know, none of, none of these um, sort of pieces tied to the announcement to really meaningfully help us get through um, this next uh, couple of weeks and help us see the light at the end of the tunnel. I think also today people were hoping that there would be, um, you know, some easing of restrictions on outdoor recreational activities. Uh, we didn't see any of that again. So I think today's announcement was just really disappointing pointing um, from the premier. What is your position on the four governments ban of outdoor amenities? You know, I think when we look at the recommendations from the science table, as well as medical experts around the province, they've been saying that um, the risk of, of uh, transmission is relatively low, and, and there are ways that people can safely participate in outdoor recreation. And, you know, we're calling on the government to reconsider that and, um, you know, ensure that people have access to um, outdoor spaces so that they can, you know, also, you know, one, stay physically active, uh, but also this has a huge impact to people's mental health and well-being. And not everyone has access to a backyard um, or green spaces. And so sometimes getting out um, and participating in outdoor recreational activities is the only way that they can get that, that access to green spaces. Do you feel like, I know in your ward, there's a lot of apartment buildings, there's a lot of condo buildings. So do you feel like your ward has probably suffered maybe the most? You know, I think, yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's a great point because in, in Brampton Centre in particular, we have a number of high-rise buildings um, and people who don't have access to parks and playgrounds. And so, you know, I think making, um, you know, spaces open for people uh, to safely, um, you know, participate in outdoor recreation is important. You know, I, I've spoken to a number of youth-serving organizations as well um, who are very concerned um, that there, there aren't, um, you know, access uh, points for, for young people to participate in recreation to keep their their minds and bodies healthy um, and so there is a disproportionate impact especially for lower income or racialized communities who don't have access to these large outdoor spaces how do you think the residents in your riding or ontario residents more generally can best combat the spread of covid19 well, you know, I think everyone has is, is been doing their part as best possible. And I think, you know, when we look at what has been contributing to the spread of COVID-19 in Brampton Centre and, and Brampton and Peel in general, um, it really is through workplace transmission. Um, this is where we see the bulk of infections taking place. And this is, again, why we need to have, you know, policies like paid sick days in place. And we need to be prioritizing the vaccination of essential workers. Um, I think had we done that uh, earlier on, if the government had followed the advice of public Public health and, and many experts who are calling for paid sick days and increased vaccinations to hotspot communities, uh, we may have been able to limit the spread that we see uh, throughout Brampton. Um, you know, in the area that I reside in, in L6Y postal code, I mean, we, we, we're seeing positivity rates uh, well above 20% in our community. Um, and this is because it's home to an, a large number of essential workers, um, for example, who are taking, you know, the 511 Zoom bus into Amazon uh, 
and getting sick. Um, so I think everyone is trying to do their part, but the public health measures and, and the policies that were needed to help spread stop the spread of COVID-19 in our communities weren't implemented and action was being taken uh, far too late to help protect our community. Which measures would you like to see the provincial government implement to better handle the pandemic? You know, I think, again, uh, you know, we've seen the government implement a paid sick day program here at a provincial level that really only provides workers with three uh, paid sick days. And, and, and the program is still very cumbersome. Uh, so we're going to continue the call to action um, as New Democrats to push the government to ensure that there's a minimum of 10 uh, days that workers can access. Um, you know, uh, isolation is required for 14 days. Um, you know, if you're sick, you, you have to be off for more than three days. Um, the, the three days that are provided are, are simply inadequate. And I think aren't going to help us uh, stop the spread of, of COVID-19 in our workplaces. I think the other uh, call to action here is increasing our vaccine supply. I mean, we know we see pop-up clinics, um, you know, happening in our community, but they don't have enough supply. So within an hour, they're completely booked up. Um, and this means that essential workers uh, who may not have had access to, you know, vaccine hunters on Twitter um, weren't able to get that information and book uh, an appointment in a timely manner, or if they were able to get the information. Uh, it was uh, a little too late and then everything was booked up. So I think getting a greater supply of vaccines to our community will help us actually get people vaccinated, our essential workers, more importantly, vaccinated. Um, you know, folks like our educators um, need to ensure that they get their vaccines as well. Additionally, I would have loved to see uh, the premier make a commitment to addressing the issues in our schools, um, you know, capping class sizes, for example, improving ventilation. Um, this is how we're going to get our schools open, which I know everyone wants to see um, happen. Um, but in tandem, if those investments are not made to keep our students and our educators and, and staff in schools safe, um, it's going to be really hard for us to reopen safely. So I think that it needs to be a combination of so many things. And again, that's why today's announcement was so so disappointing um, because none of the measures that we need to keep our communities safe are actually being implemented by this government. Ten areas in Brampton to date are now among those with the highest COVID-19 percent positivity rate in all of Ontario. Does this number worry you? Why do you think that this is happening and what can be done to curb the spread? You know, again, it, I think it goes back to the point that, you know, we have a, a, a very high population of our workforce here in Peel. Um, more than half of our workforce, in fact, um, are folks that cannot work from home. Um, and so when you look at the data um, in those hotspot communities, I mean, these are, are communities where you have large numbers of essential workers. You also have multi-generational homes um, and, you know, areas with um, high-rise buildings, for example, where you have multiple people living in, in, in those homes. It's a it's a almost a, a recipe for disaster here in the Peel region um, because none of the public health measures and policies that we needed to help protect and address these these underlying factors were implemented through the pandemic. Um, you know it is very worrisome that essential workers, uh, racialized uh, essential workers, are being forced into this this situation um, without protections. Uh, again, I think you know in order for us to have a meaningful impact and stop the spread in our communities, uh, we need to ensure that workers can stay home if they are sick. Uh, we need to ensure that they have timely access to a vaccine, both their first and second doses, um, and that we make sure that, um, you know, they have the supports that they need um, to prevent the spread in our community. Uh, again, those investments were never made. Um, you know, that's why in many of our, our communities, like across the Peel region, we saw that schools had to be shut down earlier than other parts of the province um, because we are such a hot spot. Um, so I, I want to encourage the government to do the right thing to help us to protect our communities um, but they just continue to sort of neglect us. What are your thoughts on the four governments handling of the COVID-19 pandemic? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's a sentiment that I hear uh, across the, the city. Um, you know, when I'm speaking with constituents, uh, they're really feeling as though we were neglected here in Brampton. I mean, when you think of uh, the vaccine rollout, um, you know, when the uh, pharmacy pilot program was announced, uh, not a single location here in Peel offering uh, those vaccines through that pilot program. Um, we know for a fact, as the data indicates, that Peel did not receive its fair share of vaccines per 100,000, um, you know, communities like Kingston 
been receiving a far greater number of, of vaccines, even though they, they had a relatively low uh, community transmission rate. Um, you know, I, I think people want to know why that happened. Um, you know, our essential workers who frankly were risking their lives to keep other parts of the province moving um, uh, do feel neglected um, and don't feel that the right resources were allocated to our community. Um, you know, ICU doctors um, from, from the start of the second wave were very clear that, they, that, that we were going to reach a crisis point. Uh, the investments that were needed to keep our communities safe and, and help prevent this from happening were never made. Um, so it's really disappointing, um, you know, for our, for our city of Brampton. And it's not just, uh, you know, myself as an opposition member that's raised this. I think we've also heard this from members of council, our mayors, um, who have been calling for uh, bigger and, and better investments in our community and a more equitable share of uh, vaccines. Um, those measures were never never put in place uh, to help us stop the spread. And so it started to spread like wildfire really quickly. And, you know, to use the analogy of, you know, when your house is on fire, it's not that you go three doors down and start putting out the fire. Uh, you point the fire hose exactly where it needs to go on the burning house. Um, the province's approach was to sort of sprinkle water everywhere else and, and completely ignore our community. Um, and I think people really paid the price for the government's inaction. You have been quite vocal about how the Ford government has failed those in long-term care homes. What does the Ford government need to do in the aftermath of the Ontario Long-Term Care COVID-19 Commission report and the tragedies in these LTC homes? Where does the accountability lie? Oh, thank you so much for the question. I think it's a really important one. Um, I think one area that... Uh, is most heartbreaking in terms of the impacts was in our long-term care sector. And, uh, you know, I think it's important to point out that, um, you know, this is a sector that has been neglected for decades. And, you know, when the pandemic um, hit uh, long-term care, I mean, this really put things into a crisis perspective for a lot of folks. And, you know, it's it's the long-term care commissioner's uh, report. It's um, the auditor general's report. We also see through the military, the Canadian Armed Forces report, um, that there are some uh, very serious systemic issues here, whether that's related to staffing shortages, um, the lack of infection control measures. Um, these aspects were never addressed by this government once the pandemic started. Um, the Long-Term Care Commission provides 85 different recommendations that uh, you know the government has not even yet committed to implementing. I think to start moving us forward, we need to start taking the profit out of long-term care. Um, what we saw in many instances um, and still continue to see is that profit uh, has been um, the primary motive um, and which has compromised care in many of these long-term care homes. Um, the staffing shortage, um, you know, is is really devastating um, because, uh, you know, PSWs, nurses, um, they are not being paid a fair wage. Um, and many of the CEOs and shareholders of these for-profit homes are walking away with record-breaking bonuses um, after this pandemic, um, yet they refuse to pay their employees a livable wage. Um, so I think that there, there are so many recommendations that have been made um, that the government can implement. And I think it starts with, you know, making sure that we make the pandemic pay a permanent um, increase for workers in, in the sector so that we can attract and retain uh, PSWs and, and RPN to the sector. Um, it also starts by, I think, you know, transitioning those homes um, from a for-profit model to a not-for-profit model um, so that we can make sure that, you know, profit isn't the motive and that care is what's driving um, those homes. It also means that we need to increase infection control measures. I mean, the SARS Commission back uh, in, in 2013 made very clear recommendations on that. Uh, unfortunately, the Liberal government did not act on those recommendations, and we see Conservatives continue to neglect the sector as well. Um, so I, you know, I can keep going on in terms of what needs to happen, but what's unfortunate is that there has been no accountability um, and no real commitment from the Minister of Long-Term Care or Premier Ford um, with respect to how they're going to fix the mess that we know is happening in long-term care. I understand that you have criticisms about the wages of nurses. What would your government do to tackle this? So, you know, we have, uh, from prior to the pandemic, been calling on the governments of the day uh, to create a mandatory minimum standard of care for, for folks in long-term care. Um, you know, right now, um, some residents are, are not getting the level of care that they need. So by creating a standard of care, which is a four-hour minimum of hands-on care, um, that means that then we would address the staffing crisis to ensure that we're, we're reaching those, those standards. Um, you know, I think, again, when we look at what's happening in the sector, I mean, these are folks that are being employed um, 
through uh, agencies. They are part time. Um, they are precariously paid in low paying um, work. And so I think to address some of the staffing crisis, you need to pay folks uh, fairly. You need to make these good paying jobs and um, full time jobs so people will want to work in the sector and be able to support their families. Um, you know, I can recall meeting with um, PSWs even before the pandemic started, um, and many of them are working at two or three jobs in the sector and then working outside of that in order to make ends meet. Um, that shouldn't be the case. Um, I think we have to fix the staffing ratios. We need to ensure people are paid fairly so that we can retain um, the, the, the staff that we need to, to provide the care for our elders. Currently, doses of the COVID-19 vaccine are distributed four months apart in Ontario. This is despite the fact that Pfizer recommends 21-day intervals between dosages. Moderna suggests that the second dose be followed after four weeks. And the creators of Oxford AstraZeneca recommend between four and 12-week intervals between dosages. What do you think about the longer delay in between these dosages? Why is this happening and what possible negative implications will come from this? Well, you know, I'm, I'm not a, a medical expert and I think that what we need to do is follow the advice of, um, you know, those medical experts and, and, and find ways to expedite the process in which people can get their second shot. We know that people are still susceptible to COVID-19 until they've received the second dose. And so, you know, we are looking for ways um, and, and hoping that the government will shorten that time period so that people can get vaccinated. Um, I'm just hoping that it isn't as slow and sloppy as the first rollout was. Um, but I think there's a lot of concerns with the weights. Um, you know, I think there are you know, homebound seniors, for example, who have yet to even receive their first dose of the vaccine. Um, and so I think, you know, the government has a responsibility here to uh, uh, clearly communicate to the public um, with respect to the extended wait period of, of the second dose and find ways to minimize this so we can more quickly and effectively fully vaccinate our population. There's been many increased discussions surrounding the likelihood of an extension on the stay at home order from May 20th to at least June. What is your thoughts on the extending of the stay at home order? I know that they have just announced today that they're extending until at least June 2nd. You know, again, as, as we discussed earlier, I think it's it's yet again a, a, another disappointing announcement. Um, you know, I think people are really looking um, for these lockdowns to end. I mean, we've had some one of the longest lockdowns um, in, in the in the country, frankly, um, and and it's been really frustrating. You know, I think of small business owners who are struggling right now to keep uh, their doors closed um, and keep themselves afloat. Many are on the brink of bankruptcy if they haven't declared. So already, um, you know, I really worry about what this means to our economy um, at a local level as well. And um, with those small businesses being forced out of business and um, not receiving any supports from this government. And I think that's been the most difficult part of this for everyone is, um, you know, we all understand that we're facing a pandemic. Um, but for the government to continue to neglect, um, you know, communities, small business, um, not follow the public health recommendations of their own science table, makes this so much more frustrating and difficult for folks. And, and COVID fatigue is, is, is real, you know, and I can empathize with that. As I think we're all feeling that. Um, but like I said, what makes this even more difficult is the fact that the investments we need in our communities are not being made. And so we see longer um, lockdowns um, and sort of this pattern. Um, so, you know, another two weeks of a lockdown here, um, without any of the public health recommendations being implemented, does this mean that when we reopen, we may see the, more of the same? Um, you know, it's it's really confusing to people. Um, and, you know, I, I really hope um, that this will be the last lockdown. But I think at, at the end of the day, if the government is going to implement the public health measures we need, um, it's just going to continue to prolong this, this merry-go-round, essentially, that we're on. Some small businesses have expressed the great toll that this pandemic has had on them and have displayed apprehension in regards to extending the stay-at-home order. What do you think should be done to ensure that these businesses are getting the support that they need during these difficult times? 
You know, I think from the beginning of the pandemic, it's uh, as new Democrats, uh, we've been very clear that small business needs support. Um, you know, it's been a, a very confusing time while, you know, big box stores like, uh, you know, Costco and Walmart have been able to keep their doors open while small businesses have been forced to close them. Um, and then in tandem, not receiving any direct financial support from the government. I mean, um, you know, the small business grant, uh, one of the, the big issues that my office is dealing with right now is, is small businesses who are, are not even getting a response from the government with respect to their application. Um, so it's just, it's a, a really chaotic situation for many small businesses because, I mean, this isn't just a business. I mean, these are folks that are part of our community. Um, you know, it's not their business that's just suffering. It's also their livelihoods, their ability to take care of their families, to pay their mortgage, to put food on the table. Um, there are serious, you know, economic and financial consequences to our community um, because the government is not adequately supporting businesses. You know, I've spoken to people in the personal care sector, um, you know, folks that are operating uh, gyms, um, you know, folks that are in the trucking and logistics industry, taxi industry, um, you know, uh, driving instructors, the list goes on and on of businesses that are just at their wit's end because the government is not stepping up to help them weather this storm. And I can appreciate that frustration coming from a small business family. I mean, your fixed costs are still there. Um, they are not going anywhere um, through the pandemic and they're piling up for many of these businesses without the relief, the direct financial supports that they need to help offset those costs. And then think of even what a reopening is going to look like. Some critics of the Ford government have argued that the government has failed the people of Brampton, especially low income and essential workers during this pandemic. What is your take on the statement? Do you think that Brampton is alone in this? No, not at all. Um, I think, you know, the sentiment here in Brampton, um, especially from our uh, low income racialized communities and, and others, frankly, uh, in realizing what systemic discrimination looks like, um, it's very apparent that there was a, not an equity strategy in place from this government, something that New Democrats called on the government to adopt uh, very early on in this pandemic because uh, the data was clear, um, you know, racialized communities, um, not only here in Peel, but in, in for example, Scarborough and in, in Humber River, Black Creek. Um, these communities were being disproportionately impacted because these were, uh, you know, often uh, racialized, um, precariously employed, um, low-waged employees um, who were who were being, you know, essentially forced to go into work and and getting sick. Um, and so when you 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 look at this in in, in that perspective, you do realize that there is uh, inequity in the system. I mean, even look at how the vaccines were rolled out. Um, again, you see communities um, where uh, there, there weren't large numbers of essential workers um, receiving larger doses. Um, folks were able to uh, book a vaccine um, while working from home and, and be able to do that without ever missing a, a single dollar of pay. Um, but for essential workers in communities like Peel and Scarborough, I mean, they were lining up for hours in the snow and sleet in order to access a, a vaccine. Um, the whole rollout was just so inequitable and, and so unfortunate um, that this is what we see uh, the government choose to adopt as an approach. I also, you know, had a chance to speak with members of, of the ethnic media and, and uh, you know, press because they also have shared with me that, uh, you know, the, the government was not using them as a resource to communicate with the communities with respect to um, their own announcements and, and, and vaccine rollout. And so it just makes you wonder, um, you know, why this type of an approach was applied, why certain communities were neglected. Um, and I think also highlights that there is systemic discrimination built in uh, to to the, the approach that the government has, has uh, taken here in Ontario. Well, what, what kind of approach would you take? You know, I think when we looked at the vaccine, um, you know, command table when it first came out, um, you know, it was very clear that there wasn't, um, you know, a strategy in place to reach out to to ethnic communities, um, to racialized communities. And those were the communities that were the hardest hit. Um, you know, you look at making sure that there is a, a communications expert, for example, that would help us reach out to, um, you know, a, a wide range of diverse communities. Um, none of that work was done. Um, and so I think for, from our perspective, 
perspective, you know, applying an equity lens would acknowledge that those communities were disproportionately impacted by COVID and that they needed a greater share of vaccines and also support in terms of how we were communicating. You know, I think the rhetoric um, that was put forward by the government was that these communities were vaccine hesitant. That was not what happened in reality. The moment that pop-up clinics were made available, we had people lining up and um, trying to get access to a vaccine. It was simply a distribution issue, um, you know, that was inequitable um, because when vaccines were made available, racialized communities took advantage of those in very large numbers. And again, going back to the point um, that because we never received our fair share, many people were left without um, access to a vaccine um, because those communities weren't given the, um, the, the number of vaccines that they needed uh, to actually vaccinate the, the community in an effective way. Well, I know for I know for your writing that uh, vaccines can be distributed. Um, people with the postal code uh, in Brampton can go as far away as 100 kilometers as far as Simcoe County. So what do you have to say about that? Because unless someone's staying in their local area, maybe they're not able to access a vaccine. But if they just go maybe to the next city or a few kilometers outside where they do have this available, um, what, what are your thoughts on this? You know, I think um, we, we saw that with, um, you know, the pharmacy pilot program as well, where, you know, people were sort of crossing over to other public health units in order to access um, their vaccines. You know, we had folks coming from Burlington into Toronto, for example, in order to get access. Uh, it just shows you that there really, um, I think, isn't uh, the right approach in place. Um, you know, if you're giving communities who are hotspot postal codes uh, uh, the right amount of supply, folks don't need to leave their community to access a vaccine. And I think also, you know, every resource that should have been deployed in our community was not deployed. Um, you know, uh, faith-based organizations, for example, um, you know, indicated that there, there was a willingness for them to set up pop-up clinics, but they weren't being provided the resources to do so. Um, so, you know, I think folks in Brampton wanted to be able to access a, a vaccine in Brampton. They should not have to go to another public health unit in order to get the vaccine. We should have received our fair share here in Peel, and then that way people in our community could have stayed in their own community in order to access a vaccine. No one should have to leave their community to do so. Now, I know that you're mentioning low-income workers, people working in basically factories or working in a very close proximity, being paid a very low wage. Um, I do understand that the current government has a program where they're going into workplaces that are highly infected and they actually have the vaccines available there. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? You know, I think it's um, it's a first step to help us get those essential workers vaccinated. Um, it's unfortunate that, um, you know, this didn't happen um, earlier um, because, you know, this is where we saw the bulk of transmission and outbreak happening um, in our communities. So I think it's a, it's a good step that, you know, workers are able to get vaccinated, um, but this doesn't help cover all the other workplaces um, that folks might um, be employed through. Um, you know, for example, if you're working in transportation or if you're in the taxi, industry um, and not connected to one of these warehouses, um, you won't get access to a vaccine through them. And so, you know, again, I think that what we needed to do was in addition to um, some of the workplace pop-up clinics is we need to see more resources being allocated to additional pop-up clinics in our community so that every essential worker, regardless of where they worked, um, was able to access the vaccine in a timely fashion. In previous interviews, I've spoken to the current government and they've expressed their lack of access to the vaccine. They told me they were selecting areas that they thought would curb the spread the most. How would your government distribute the vaccine? Oh, uh, you know, I think there, there certainly were issues with supply, but I think ultimately, um, you know, from a distribution perspective was where we really saw the government drop the ball. Um, again, you know, the data is very clear um, that, uh, you know, communities with lower rates of transmission were getting higher percentages of vaccines than communities like Peel, um, who had very high rates of transmission, uh, but were not receiving the same fair uh, share um, in terms of the vaccine allocation. And again, that's why we uh, have indicated and, and will continue to say that we need to follow the 
advice of of, of the Ontario Science Table, um, who was very clear that um, you know there were there were specific communities that needed to get a greater share of vaccines, um, and that those hotspot communities needed to get. Uh, you know, at one point the government was only allocating 25% of the vaccines to our community. For example, um, we were supposed to be getting 50, um, and then even when they increased it to 50% in terms of the allocation of that uh, supply. Uh, that that was still spread out over 114 postal codes when the science table recommended that it only be limited to 74. So I think taking a more concentrated approach would have helped us get a greater share of vaccines to communities like Peel, where we are a hot spot, um, and that would have helped us um, make sure that we could vaccinate our essential workers and our communities more effectively and rapidly. Um, but what we saw the government do was distribute that supply to areas that weren't in outbreak, that weren't um, experiencing high rates of transmission. Uh, and this meant that communities like ours uh, here in Brampton were neglected in that rollout. So again, as I said, I think, you know, when you apply an equity lens and you look at the data and you look at this from an evidence-based perspective, um, it was very clear where we needed to allocate the vaccines. Um, the government chose not to do that. And so I don't think it's necessarily just a supply issue. I think we had a real distribution issue here as well and a prioritization issue as well. Thank you, MPP Sarah Singh. You were watching News Talk with Julia Cosby at the International News Channel of TAG TV.